One of the things about the Torah that I love so much is that it's full of names. The Torah, in many ways, is all about names. Adam is first created to be a partner to God in naming all the animals. We have lists of names, genealogies, all kinds of characters that get names. And then we have people who get names and change their names in the middle of the book, too. So that happens. And better not forget, we have a whole book that's called Shmot. It's the book of names. And so I think about names a lot. And what I want to tell you about today is a time in my life when I got to change a name and with that go through the exact kind of experience that Abraham went through and Sarah went through and Jacob went through because when their names changed, they became different people. Now, the names I was given at birth by my parents, I got the name Jane. I think because my mother really loved Jane Austen, and she was kind of hoping I would grow up to be a genteel lady. <laughs> but then my parents, I have no idea, gave me a second name. They gave me the name Yenta. <laughs> it's hard not to laugh when you hear that. I have no idea why they gave me the name Yenta, but I went through life with that name, and basically, until today, never told too many people that I was going through life with the name Yenta. But about seven and a half years ago, I got a chance to pick another name for myself. And that's the story I want to tell you. My son and daughter-in-law told me that they were going to have a child. Now, at the first moment when I heard that news, my heart just swelled. I was beyond excited and happy and thrilled. But I also immediately started obsessing about what did I want to be called? If I was going to get a name, I wanted to pick a name that fit. And I talked about it for seven and a half months. What would I be called? Because this time, I had a chance to pick a name. Did I want to be Savta? Did I want to be Granny? Did I want to be Grandma? I just wasn't sure. And I would just talk to everybody I knew and say, like, what do you think I should be called? And then one day, I was talking to my daughter-in-law, and I said the word, Bubby. And she did this. She went, Bubby? I loved my puppy. And at that moment, I had a flash when I realized that I had to become Bubby. That after all of the years of suppressing one Yiddish name and everything that went with it, I was going to take on another name and become Bubby. Partly because I really knew and could feel that inside the way my daughter-in-law just said the word Bubby, the way it would just roll off of her mouth, Bubby, Someday I wanted that little person, who I hadn't met yet, to say the name Bubby with the same love and feelings of comfort and attachment that my daughter-in-law had for her own Bubby. So I became Bubby. I still don't like to tell people my name is Yenta. I think now it's too late. <laughs> but Bubby I became. And in the process of being a Bubby, I learned a lot about what it means to be a Bubby in the true sense that the Torah teaches us things, but in the living, through the experience of living with Torah, we understand that those things mean more. And what I've come to do over the last seven and a half years is develop what I like to call the Torah of Bubbyhood, which is so much larger than just my one job and my one role as a grandmother. And I want to tell you a little bit about the Torah of Bubbyhood. Like all Torah, it has mitzvot that are grounded in real life experience. There's three mitzvot in the Torah of Bubbyhood. The first one is called tzimtzum, contract. A Kabbalistic idea that refers to God when God was creating the world. And God looked around and said, if I fill the world, what room is there for anyone else, for any other creativity or any other relationships? Tzimtzum. So God willfully, at the moment of creation, contracted from the space to permit other things to occur. Now, how does that have to do with a baby and a new baby? From the very first moment I saw my grandson, I looked down at him in his little plastic box in the hospital, and I had the following impulse. My heart was pounding, and all I wanted to do in this world was pick up that baby and hold him and claim him and say, oh, I have another baby in my life. 
I could feel my maternal impulses running and firing cylinders at a fast pace. And I always felt like I was in good company because the one grandma that we might all remember from the Torah is Naomi, also a woman who changed her name. What did Naomi do the moment her daughter-in-law, Ruth, after many trials and tribulations, everything they suffered, what does she do? She picked up the baby. She did what I really, really wanted to do. She picked up the baby, and the Torah tells us, Vatahilo laomenet. She became a nursemaid to the baby. And of course, the women of the town make it worse. And they start going, a child has been born to Naomi. And so I felt validated, like, oh, I, you know, I've got a Torah of sentiment about wanting to grab this baby, make this baby my baby, walk away with the baby and say, like, hello, and take that baby. But in the same split second, I had the really, I really want to say, painful realization because the love that was coming out of me in that moment was overpowering. But I had the same realization in a split second moment. This is not your child. This is someone else's child. And that my job as a bubby was to step back, was to contract from the space and not try to be the first person in that baby's life that my job was to be second stage and that I could sit and observe and watch as this baby's new life relationships with his own parents came to be. And that that was my role, to practice tzimtzum, to contract. Now the second mitzvah of the Torah of Babihood I call Zman Kadosh, holy earmarked time. My friends and colleagues know that on Wednesdays, if you try to call me or if you try to email me about work, you won't find me. Because in my life, Wednesdays are Wednesdays with Bubby. And if you were to come into my house on Wednesday and walk in the door, you'd see the following thing. You would probably see me sitting on the floor singing Pete Seeger songs at the top of my lungs. <laughs> You might see me sitting up at the counter in my kitchen next to a little person who's slurping soup that I have made for him. And he and I, we just sit there together and look out the window at the bird feeders that are outside my kitchen window. And it looks to the naked eye that that's all we're doing, looking at the bird feeders while we slurp soup. You might see us out taking a walk but you wouldn't see anything that looks to the naked eye like productive labor. But you shouldn't be confused by that because what is invisible to the eye is what is really going on. What really is going on on Wednesdays with Bubby is a chance for me to show enormous love, attention, presence, and time devoted for that child alone. I also want to say that I've noticed that my grandchildren, they have to make Zman Kadosh for me. They're pretty busy little fellows. They have their backpacks. They come in and out with their activities. And the older they get, the less and less Zman Kadosh they have for me too. So Wednesdays with Bubby are pretty precious. Now I hope when we talk about Zman Kadosh earmark time that it will remind you or let you think about how Wednesdays with Bubby in my life is a little bit like Shabbat. Shabbat is a time when we say, set aside productive labor and allow other things to happen. The nurturing of relationships, of holiness for community, family, and friends. Now, one of my favorite teachers and bubbies, I like to think of him as a bubby, is the Svatamet, a great Hasidic master and teacher. He taught his Hasidim that the story of Noah is really not about a man and his boat. He said, don't think that. What it's really about is our life. Noah is standing, if you could imagine, out on the boat, looking at the turbulent water, at the busyness, at the destruction, everything that's happening. And that's us, six days a week. But Noah, whose name also means comfort, on the seventh day could go inside the ark which he called a Manoach, a refuge. And what did Noah find inside the ark? Who's sitting in there? The Shekhinah, God's presence inside Shabbat. 
with her wings stretched over the children of Israel, providing deep menucha, rest, presence, holiness, and time together. Now, I really love this image because most of my life, I love to think about the fact that God had a feminine presence. And that now I could begin to imagine that the Shekhinah is a bubby in some way, in that same type of earmarked Zaman Kadosh. So that's the second mitzvah. The third mitzvah is the word sipur, which means story. But I really like the Yiddish better. Let's just call it what it is. Bubby mices. <laughs> Bubby mices. Those wonderful stories. Now I have another grandson who's a big train man. He is a big train man. He could spend all day sitting on the floor with train tracks, building bridges, tunnels, everywhere you go. And there is no such thing in his life as too many trains. So he can build just all kinds of amazing stuff. And while he's building his trains, I like to tell him bubby mices, just while we're chit-chatting. My favorite story, my favorite bubby nisa, is one about my own mother, who, as a young girl, would take the cable car to downtown Chicago for her cello lesson. And why I tell my little train man these stories, his eyes get really wide, and I can just see him thinking. Because if you look at a child, you can see them thinking. And I can see him just imagining my mother on the cable car, because he knows what cable cars look like. He imagining my mother getting on the cable car with her cello. So what happens for me in that moment? It's my bubby Misa that is now creating an arc of time. And my grandson, who never knew my mom, can meet my mom, who never got to meet her great-grandson. And all of that happens because of the arc of the Misa that I'm telling of the, of the story. Now, who's the person in the Torah who's a bubby? It's not a woman. It's Moses. Moses tells the children of Israel the following at length. Now, do you remember when you were at the mountain? Do you remember? And this is what you experienced, and God gave you the Torah, and this is what, and I want you to remember this because I want you to tell it to your children and your children's children and tell these stories because they're incredibly important to remember. Only here's the thing. Those children that he's talking to weren't at the mountain at all. Moses is already creating a Bubby Misa, an imaginative story to create links between generations, another arc that could span beyond lifetimes in the power of the story and memory. So those are the three meets vote of the Torah of Babihood. Simtsum, sometimes you need to contract from the space. Zman Kadosh, earmark time to allow the relationship to develop, to allow a grandchild or anyone to feel that you have time for them alone. And third, leverage the Bubby Misa and the story and conversation as much as you can to transmit wisdom. Now, one of the nice things about having the Torah of Bubby Hood in my pocket now and thinking about it is I've had a chance to reflect about how much the Torah of Bubby Hood has nothing to do with my grandchildren at all. And I began to think about the other children in my life for whom I've become an adopted Bubby. Babies, children who are deeply precious to me who I can't wait to feed and cook for and tell stories to, who I worry about. Other children in my synagogue who sometimes will come over to sit down, tell me about their baseball game, who I can cheer on, who are getting ready to leave home and kind of want to know that they're going to be OK as they go off to college or go off to wherever they're going in their lives. But know they're going to be OK because I look at them and go, I know you're going to be OK because you are a terrific kid whatever you need. And then I'll still be here for you. And I can't wait to hear about your life adventures. And I think about the times when I really want to meddle in a relationship and say, like, I know what you should do. And I go like, uh, wait a minute. Seems soon. Contract yourself. You don't need to have an opinion all the time. <laughs> Let someone else's wisdom take shape and just watch it happen. 
And I really try hard now when I'm with friends or colleagues to give them the earmarked Zman Kadosh they deserve and not to be multitasking when what I really want to do is build a relationship with them. Or if you're a parent with a child who doesn't have a bubby in their life because they never had one, live far away, or the bubby that they might have might not be such a great bubby, <laughs> adopt someone. There might be somebody sitting three rows behind you in synagogue or upstairs in your apartment building who really, really could be adopted and could become a bubby for you. Could we apply the Torah of bubbyhood in our work relationships and in our friendships and in all the other people who we meet? I really like to imagine that bubbies are our secret weapon in the Jewish world and that bubbies are good for the whole world. And what I really like to imagine now as the Shekhinah, not spreading out wings over the children of Israel, but grabbing a couple of shopping bags because they're full of groceries. And she's on her way to cook and nourish and care for you. Thank you.